I asked you already to look at how to represent Chinese in IPA symbols, right? We haven't done that yet, right? You know the reason? Because we have to learn pinyin well first. So as long as there are people who still don't quite have pinyin mastered, we're going to hold off on that part. It's going to be kind of a crunch. We'll be very busy then, but I don't want to start writing Chinese or transcribing Mandarin into IPA until you have fully mastered pinyin. And this is a very mechanical exercise. If you know Bopomofo or Bopomofo, whatever you want to call it, pinyin is just not difficult. There are a few differences, like with Qiong is EO, for example. Uh, another one to watch out for is Yu Wong the Wong. How do you write Wong? W-E, not, not W-O. And you can ask Sophie about that because that's her name. Right, so she knows. Just look at the spelling of her name. So you need to watch out for those things and remember them. You need to know them completely by heart. They need to be automated as much as you need to learn a language and automate your language skills. And the other thing is the IPA transcription, the dictation part. Uh, that one is a separate skill because that one is not just learning things from a textbook, not just memorizing. That one involves hearing, and your brain gets what's going on. That involves a special kind of auditory brain coordination and training and practice. And some of you simply didn't have it before you came to this class. And I'm not surprised because after teaching so many years, most Taiwan students don't have that skill. It's not very well developed by the time you get here because of the way you are taught English in schools. Now, I'm thinking about this question all the time, and this is not to be negative about it. But the way English is taught here is not sound-based. You know that, right? Mainly the way you learn English is based on rules, vocabulary, and multiple choice tests. That's the main, those are the main features of how you learn English here. Very blatantly missing is the sound component. And after all these years of thinking about it, I'm convinced that sound is the basis of learning a language well. Without that sound component, you're just not going to learn it well. You will only learn pidgin, yang jing bang. So some of you are needing to compensate for that, yang mi bu. And it's going to take time and practice. So you will not fail the class if you keep on having problems with it. But I do hope to see progress on the dictations. Because that, in the end, is the real skill that we're after. Understanding li jie is very important. But that's only part of the class. After that, you need to be able to distinguish through hearing and to produce it correctly through speaking. And if you got less than 80% on the dictation, that means you really need to work on those skills more. And some of you did get 100 on that part too. So if it's below 80, you need to work on it more. And there are some practice dictations on the website that you're all aware of, right? Do they help or not so much? Are they helpful? Somewhat helpful. I, I think they're a bit improved from before, because before I had unreleased stops at the end. And listening to the recordings myself, I couldn't hear a lot of the words clearly. So I made mostly release stops at the end. And now I think it's more useful, it's clearer. If you've already done them, do them again. Maybe you've memorized the words, but in any case, use that for practice. This is how an S sounds. This is how an A sound sounds. This is how a T sounds. This is how a D sounds. Because those are the two main problems in those simple dictations, vowel quality and voice, voiceless distinction and stops. Those are the two main things. And also alveolar and velar distinctions in nasal. So that's a third thing. Those three things are the biggest problems that I have observed. observed. This is just Tiwai Hua, but I thought you might be interested. I think I will be going to Georgia again this July to sing. I love to sing Georgian choral music. And there's an opportunity that I'm probably going to apply for it. And I thought you might be interested in my Georgian textbook, my Georgian language textbook. You can see it's very worn and beat up because I studied very hard from it, but it was really hard for me to learn because Georgian is unrelated to any language at all. It's not related to any language we know of. It's only related to other Georgian dialects as far as we know. So I found it really difficult to learn vocabulary 
because everything was unfamiliar. There were just a few words like universiteti. What does that sound like? Yeah, scola. Scola. School, yeah. Posta. Posta. Yeah, post, post office. Uh, Teleponi. <laughs> All right. Those words I could handle. I remember those really fast. But as for the others, it really took a lot of effort. So I'm going back to my Georgian textbook now, and it's like candy. It's a lot of fun now. So after suffering the first time, it's now a lot of fun. I'm going to try and learn it better this time. So this is that. Just in case you're interested. OK, start with Sophie. So that was Bookshang. And now would you please get out your hand-copied rules for English consonant allophones? We're just going to read through them quick quickly. I will go over the explanations in the middle and before, just to make sure you understand everything. Now, just a quick show of hands. After you having now copied them all by hand, are there still things that are not so clear? Just be honest. I'm not going to count this against you. I just want to know if after copying the rules by hand, there are still things you're still not very clear on. Please raise your hand. If there's still a couple things not so clear. Just one, I don't believe it's just one. Two, OK, that's, I like honesty here. Right. Um, so there are still things you don't understand. You are responsible for asking and to keep on asking until you get a completely satisfactory explanation that makes it clear to you. OK, everybody? Please ask until it's clear. And you'll notice that some of the number references are wrong, right? Yeah, and that, that is a problem that's more than 10 years old. It's a very old problem, and they still haven't fixed it. And you can see that these are people who don't really care about all this indexing and this busy work because that's one weakness. It's not a serious one, but it's one weakness of this book. And it's been that way almost since I started using it, as I can remember. Because with each new edition, they change substantial things, things that have to do with content, but they often forget to do the mechanics. Or oh, the other thing I wanted to say that I didn't quite finish, I started but didn't finish. Um, did you find that by writing out the rules by hand, even if you didn't understand everything, that you understand it better now than you did before? Did writing it out by hand help you absorb some of the stuff we covered? This is what other students have told me. So I've done this, I think, ever since I started teaching this class. And the students have told me, now I get it better. Because you have to slow down, slowly absorb the content as you're writing it out. It slows you down, right? So if there are still things you don't understand, we'll clear them up now. So a good way of summarizing and slightly extending all that we have said about English consonants so far is to list a set of formal statements. When we talk about formal statements in linguistics, that means we have a very clear rule. We just write out an explicit, a clear and explicit rule. Formal statements, that means we make very clear and explicit rules about what happens. The problem is some of these are not watertight. They're not watertight. There's this famous saying that says, all grammars leak. That means there are always exceptions. And we have exceptions here. Some of the rules are not watertight. They're not, they don't describe the whole situation, OK? So it says that these rules are simply descriptions of language behavior. They are not the kind of rules that prescribe what people ought to do. This goes off on another tangent. What is prescriptive linguistics? We usually say things like prescriptive grammar. For example, prescriptive grammar. What is that? What is prescriptive grammar? That's telling people that they should talk like this and they shouldn't talk like that. For example, I told you about my third grade teacher, I think, who said, uh, not just her, a number of them, said that, don't say, can I go? You have to say, may I go? That's the kind of grammar we often learn in the, in the States. We learn prescriptive grammar. They're trying to correct what they think are mistakes in the speech of a lot of people. That's prescriptive. They're telling you what to do. They think that, can I go? is not grammatically correct, they want to fix it. They tell you not to use ain't, he ain't coming, no good, etc. Okay? That's prescriptive. And he's saying here that these are not prescriptive rules. They're just descriptions of what people actually do. Like most phoneticians, we would not presume to be arbiters. Arbiters are, 
What do we call those? What are arbiters? They're people who decide when there's a dispute. If people can't agree, then you go to a third person to try and resolve something. That means we make the decision. He said, we're not going to do that. And we're not going to say, it says arbiters of fashion, shishang, what is good and what is not. But on the other hand, phonetics, it's a part of an exact scientific discipline because we're describing physical phenomena. And that means we should be able to formalize descriptions of speech in terms of a set of precise statements. We're going to try to make them precise. And Peter Latifoger also once said, you don't really know anything until you can express it in a number. And he used to study physics. He was very good at physics and math. So he said, you have to be able to express something with a number before you really, really know it. So here we're going to try to be more precise, even if we don't have all numbers for everything. All right, given the discussion of consonant allophones in this chapter, we can give a number of descriptive rules. One of these deals with consonant length. Okay, our first reader. Number one, consonants are longer when at the end of a phrase. All right, that's our first rule. That means if we have come to a pause, a break in the discourse, ting in the difa, then the consonants are going to be longer. 因为停,停的地方,你有点空间可以发挥, is that right? So, that's our first rule. You can see the application of this statement by comparing the consonants in words such as bib, did, don, and nod. Use WaveSurfer to make a recording, then play the recording backward. Are the first two words the same backward and forward? Do the third and fourth words sound like each other? when played in reverse. Well, we played the word lull in reverse, you know that. If it's towards the end, we're going to lengthen it. We naturally lengthen things at the end. That's all it's saying. Okay, and why don't you, let's, let's go on to another reader for rule two. We'll change person after person. Most of the allophonic rules apply to only selected groups of consonants, so we're going to just talk about a certain group of consonants at a time. Alex? Two. Alex, two. Voiceless stops. Okay, don't make it too long. A lot of times you do that. What's a voiceless? It's voiceless. Make it really short. Voiceless. Voiceless right. stops. That is? What does IE mean? Id est. It's Latin, two words. ID, second word is EST. Id est. It means that is. It is. Okay. That is PTK are aspirated when they are syllable initial, as in words such as pip, test, kick. Very good. I think we'll stay with you for the next one, too. So everyone knows this rule. This one's really easy, right? So if it's at the beginning of a word, then we aspirate the voiceless stops. Okay, syllable initial, not just the beginning of the word, also the beginning of a syllable, but the one at the beginning of the word will be aspirated more. It's not in the rule, but that will happen. So if it's also the beginning of a syllable, but it's later in the word, it will be aspirated less. Good. Continue, Alex. Three, obstruents, stops, and fricatives classified as voiced. That is, B, D, G. But the G. But the G. V, V, Z, 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 Are voiced through only a small part of the articulation when they are uh, when they occur at the end when of when they uh, again when they occur no d at the end yeah no when they occur at the mm, end i still it's probably a tsojia uh, link it and then i won't hear a d when they occur at when they occur at yeah. the end of an utterance or before a voiceless sound listen to the v when you say Try to improve, and the d when you say add to. Okay, so if it's at the end of an utterance, it'll only be voiced halfway through, and if it comes right before a voiceless sound, it also will only be partly voiced. Voiced in the first half, the second half probably not voiced. So listen carefully. Improve, everybody. Improve. You hear that f at the end? No voicing there. And the second one is add to. Add. We're already turning off the voicing to get ready for tea. 
So add two, everyone? Add two. Yeah, the add is going to be cut off rather than making it fully voiced as it would be if there were a vowel next. For example, add it, add it. There's no turning off of the voicing then. Good. Okay, I think we can switch now. Sherry. Okay. So called voice stops and uh, Give Africans. a number, please. Uh, number four. Yeah. So called voiced stops and affricates, but the gotcha are voiceless when syllable initial, except when immediately preceded by a voice sound, as in a voiced a, sound, a voiced sound, as in a day, as compared with this day. Use wave surfer to listen to the stay part of this part the stay of, part of this day. The stay, uh, the stay part of this day. Does it sound like stay? All right, and the answer is yes. Their point is at the beginning of an utterance. If we've just had a pause and we're starting a new utterance, then it says so-called voice stops in Africans. Underlying leads I detung. They are definitely voiced, no arguing about that. But on the surface, many of them are not voiced when they are, or very often they are not voiced when they're at the beginning of an utterance. So we say, like, we say things like boy, does, go, judge. No voicing, instead of saying boy, does, go, judge. And note that affricates tend to behave a little more like stops than, af than fricatives. Affricates, they tend to behave more like stops. They are both. They have the character, characteristics of both, but they're a little bit more like stops. Good. And continue again, Sherry. Uh, number five, voiceless stops are unaspirated after s in words such as spi, uh, 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 spi. Try F-E-W, and it rhymes with that word. How do you say F-E-W? F-E-W. -E oh, few. Right. Oh. It, it rhymes with that. Spew, stew, skew. Good. All right. So spew, we definitely have the U sound in American. But how about the next word? We don't usually say stew. That sounds pretty funny. We say stew. Stew. And the Brits, they wouldn't say stew either. They would say stew. Stew. They would have affrication there. And for stew, we've dropped it. For slew, we've also dropped the y sound. So why is there a difference? Spew, we cannot drop that y sound. We can't say spoo. Spudeira, there's no word, spoo, except on Halloween. Maybe a spook, I don't know. Spoo. <laughs> but anyway, it had, there has to be a y there for spew. But for stew and skew, okay, I thought it was slew, sorry. All right, it's skew, the third one is skew. Skew means to what? That's skew. To skew the results. That means to distort the results. So we say spew, and we say stew, and then we say skew again. What's the rule that determines that? It's not an airtight rule again, not watertight or airtight. Why can we get rid of the y in stew, but not in spew and skew? There's a, there's a good way to explain it. It has to do with delta zu, if you remember. Some people didn't understand that analogy. One person asked me after class. It has to do with the delta zu. Anybody explain? Annie, any idea? With E? T? Okay. Not just T, but remember I well consola without wearing my reading glasses. I thought it was slew. Slu is slay the guo chu shi Slay. S L A Y Guo Chu Shi is a slu. He slew ten men, whatever. You can say slu instead of slew. We wouldn't say slew at all. So L also has the same rule. You can drop the yi, and it's for the same reason. So it's right, Annie's right that it has to do with the T, but it's bigger than just T. It includes alveolars, because the largest number of sounds of consonants in English are alveolars. That's the biggest group. They have the most clout, C-L-O-U-T, clout. That means they have the biggest clout, the most clout, the biggest influence. So N, L, T, those words will often 
lose their y after them if there's a, a vowel after them. And they originally had y. Okay? Um, so, voiceless stops are unaspirated after s. I think everybody's got that now, no problem. And we just, that's a big part of your um, plot assignment. And since I mentioned plot, just to tell you very quickly, it's three words per file. There are six groups, six columns of words. Each one's a separate file. So six files with three words each, and then in the seventh file, cut off the S. That's your seventh. Okay, so seven files all together. Okay? Um, let's read the next rule. Number six, voiceless obstruents. Are longer than the corresponding voice obstruents, b, d, g, j, v, v, z, j, when at the end of a syllable. Okay, end. 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 At the end of a syllable. Good. Everybody, watch. End. Because some of you are still saying and at the end of a syllable should be end. If you put your hand here, my experience so far this semester is everybody gets it immediately. No mistakes. Everyone, end. 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 Now, just doing this won't do it. That sounds it. This works. End. end. Perfect. Good. Okay. Mm hmm And so, voiceless obstruents, putaka, et cetera, are longer. And somebody asked on NTU Phonetics on Facebook why they would be longer. It's because you need to imagine that there is a word that starts with a consonant right after it. So if we have, for example, um, for example, for example, um, top dog, top dog, top 后面停顿那个时间很长 But if it's then, for example, Rob Peter, Rob Peter, 后面停顿的时间并没有那么长 And there's voicing in part of it. So top dog, but Rob Peter 比较短 Okay. That's how it works. Is that clear? You have to imagine that right after that word that ends in a consonant, there's another word that starts with a consonant. And that will show you how long that so wait a pause is. It could be an empty pause or it could be a filled pause with some voicing in it, like Rob Peter. Rob. It's got some voicing in it. Is everybody clear on what I just said? Is there anybody who didn't get it? Please raise your hand. I want to make sure it's clear because it's a good question. Um, so I think that should be pretty clear. So that applies both to stops and to fricatives and affricates. Words exemplifying this rule are um, cup as opposed to uh, cap, sorry, cap as opposed to cab, and back as opposed to bag. Try contrasting these words in sentences, and you may be able to hear the differences more clearly. Okay, next seven. Number seven. The approximants, the, the approximant w, er, y, l, are at least partially voiceless when they occur after an initial p, t, k, as in play, twin, q, mm -hmm. play, twin, twin. Uh -huh. play, okay. twin, q. Good. And we use that little empty circle underneath the approximant to show that it's voiceless. And do you remember what we said, I think, in last class? When do we usually use that circle? Because there are all kinds of voiceless sounds. We don't write B with a little circle under it for the P sound, right? Or the sound, we could use it, no, not in spot. We wouldn't use it there either. We don't normally use that unless what? Yes, unless we expect it to be voiced. Usually when it was originally voiced and we expect it to be voiced, but it's not, then we can use this symbol to show that it is devoiced. This is due to the overlapping of the gesture required for aspiration with the voicing gesture required for the approximants. So um, we have aspiration from the first voiceless stop. That aspiration is sort of extinguishing the voicing. And note that the formal statement says at least partially voiceless, but the transcription marks, uh, marks the approximants as being completely voiceless. So they may be partly voiced. So that just tells you, 至少是部分是无声的, okay? 
Mm, conflicts between statements and transcriptions of this kind will be further discussed below, or discussed further below. Let's go on, next. Wendy, number nine, uh, number eight. Right. The gestures for consecutive stops overlapped so that stops are unexploded when they occur before another stop in another word. Another stop? Before, before another, another stop. stop yeah. In words such as a pat right. and rub, rubbed, rubbed, rubbed. Yeah, everybody apt. Instead of saying apt, you could say that. It's pretty awful with a microphone. I know apt. You could say that, but we almost never do. It's usually unexploded because there's another consonant after it. So if we have two consonants, two stops in a row, then the first one will generally be unexploded. The second one probably will be too if it's at the end of an utterance. And rub, uh, rubbed, rather. Everyone, rubbed. rubbed. We don't say rubbed, rubbed. There's not going to be a schwa there, rubbed. And nine? In many accents in English, of, of English, right. syllable final are, syllable final, syllable final are accompanied by an overlapping glottal stop gesture, as in pronunciations of tip, pit, kick. Okay. As tip, pit, kick. So tip, uh, we've got a little creak in there. Pit, kick. Okay. I'm exaggerating just so you can hear it. So it says here, this is another case where transcription cannot fully describe what is going on. And that is true of transcriptions in general. You can see so far that he keeps ko saying, well, it says voiceless, but maybe it's only partially voiceless, right? Now, I want you to think, how do most people learn how to pronounce a word they don't know in Taiwan? Not you people here who've had this training, but just somebody who wants to know how to pronounce an English word, what do they do? Guess. Oh, they guess, yeah, that's the first thing they'll do. Which is not bad, because you can't always run to the dictionary, that's true. But if they really want to know, what do they think it means to really, really know the pronunciation? Look it up in the dictionary and use the, the KK symbols. Now do you understand why KK symbols, I'm not criticizing KK, KK is great, I think we should keep it. But do you understand why that's not enough? Because KK is, li is missing so much information. We're giving you a lot more here and we're still apologizing. But KK has a lot, yeah, a lot less information. For example, do they tell you that the, that the T is tapped in water and little? Do they tell you that? No. So KK is missing lots and lots and lots and lots of information. Things that we don't describe here either, you need to get by hearing. And that goes back to what I was saying. You need to learn a language by hearing. And that's what's missing. OK. Go on. You mean, uh, number 10, in many accents of English, T is replaced by a glottal stop when it occurs before an alveolar nasal in the same Alveolar. A alveolar. No, not villar. Alveolar. Alveolar right. nasal in the same word. Same. Same right. word as in bitten. What? Bitten. <laughs> Look at it carefully. Look at the symbol. Bitten. B is not what we need here. B. -n. Yeah, that's right. Okay. B. -n. B. -n. Mm. B mm. Yeah, usually if I'm saying it slowly, I'm going to put a T in there. I guess I didn't do that paragraph before. I'll come back to that. So normally I would put an un unreleased T there, B mm, if I'm saying it really clearly and slowly. B See my tongue? B B mm. Everyone? B mm. But I don't have to have that T there. B mm. B mm. But you have to have a really clear, strong glottal stop there. B mm. Beaten. Beaten. Right. Okay. Oh, wait, we're not done with this yet. Uh, first of all, I need to go back to that paragraph I skipped. We were talking about that creak before or at the same time as a final stop, final voiceless stop here. It says it doesn't apply to all varieties of English. For a long time, I did not know what they were talking about. I said I must not have it. And I, I don't think I do usually. I don't usually do this, but I can do it. I finally got it. So pick, pick. If you've got pit, if you cut it off in your, uh, at your glottis, pick, pick, then you've got the glottal stop there. Because pick, I just usually don't do that. I don't think. I don't do that as far as I know. 
but I get it now. And it, so he says it doesn't apply to all varieties of English. When I saw that, I felt a little better, because at the beginning, I really didn't know what he was talking about. Some people do not have any glottal stops in these circumstances, and others have glottal stops completely replacing some or all of the voiceless stops. But usually, that doesn't happen except with T or before a word starting with another consonant is possible sometimes, but usually it's T. In any case, even for those who simply add a glottal stop, this statement is not completely accurate. Many people will have a glottal stop at the end of a cat in phrases such as, that's a cat, cat, they've got one there, or the cat sat on the mat, but they will not have this allophone of T in the cat eats fish, or the cat eats fish, if it's an American, cat eats, we've got a tap there, for example, then we don't need a glottal stop. Just, do you understand this paragraph okay? If you don't, please just raise your hand. Please do not be shy, there is no shame. Remember the, the old uh, saying is, there's no stupid question except the one you don't ask. That's a stupid question. If you have a question, don't ask it. That's stupid. But no question is stupid. Usually the more basic a question is, the more important it is. Because if it's a really basic question, it challenges assumptions. And whatever happens, whenever you go deeply into a subject, you get further and further away from your initial assumptions, right? The more deeply you go, the less you will go back to those basic beginning assumptions. Do you see what I'm saying? And the further away you get from those, the less likely you are to challenge them. But some of them could be wrong. Some of them may be quite wrong. What will happen is some student, especially a freshman, they will ask a very basic question because they really don't get it. And suddenly it makes everybody think and, chal and, and, and challenge those initial assumptions. So never be ashamed of a basic question. They're often the most important. And they're the ones that really make us think the hardest, things we forget to think about. Um, all right, so we already did T and glottal stops. And this one, it's often replaced by a glottal stop. When we have an alveolar nasal in the same word, we call those two sounds which have the same place of articulation, we call that home organic. Home organic, remember, a home organic nasal, H-O-M-O-R-G-A-N-I-C, home organic, same place of articulation. Okay, and 11? Number 11, nasals are syllabic at the end of a word when immediately after an obstruent, as in leaden, chasm. Very good, leaden, chasm, usually they are syllabic. Chasm. I have no vowel there. Chasm. I could say chasm. Some people say chasm, so I could have a vowel there. Leaden is okay, but usually we say, we say leaden with nasal plosion. Nasal plosion. Okay? Mm -hmm. Note that we cannot say that nasals become syllabic where, whenever they occur at the end of a word, or, yeah, um, and after a consonant. The nasals in kiln, film, are not syllabic in most accents of English. Kiln is yao, 就是陶,陶一用的那个陶. And film, film, do we have an extra syllable with the M? Film. How many syllables? One. However, some people say film. It's not standard, but you will hear it, film. My father used to say it as a joke. Okay, he just thought it was funny, so he would say, I'll go get the film, just for fun. Okay, he'd say a lot of funny things for fun. Okay, and um, we can, however, state a rule describing the syllabicity. Syllabicity is a good word. The syllabicity of ul by saying simply, number 12. Phoebe, number 12. Lateral l is syllabic at the end of a word when immediately after a consonant. All right, but we have, a trouble, we have trouble with that, don't we? How do you say 女孩子? Yeah, is it syllabic? No, so do we have problems with this rule? And this, this problem is also more than 10 years old. It's probably much longer than 10 years because this book goes back to the 50s, I think. So this, this, this one has not really been sorted out yet. It's still not really correct. We will use these as rules of thumb. We want it to be really rigorous. Rigorous is 严谨. That's a really good word to know, rigorous. We want to be rigorous. 
but all, most of the rules leak. Most of them have exceptions. They're not, they don't describe all of the eventualities, all of the possibilities. All right, and this statement summarizes the fact that l is syllabic not only after stops and fricatives, as in paddle, whistle, and it's not syllabic for me there, paddle, whistle, right? If it were syllabic, it would be paddle, whistle. It would be, it would have lateral, whistle, whistle, paddle, dl. What's that called? Lateral, everybody? It's the same word as I asked for a minute ago with nasal. Lateral plosion, right. If they had lateral plosion, then they would be syllabic because there's no intervening vowel, no schwa there. But in my speech, they are not syllabic because there's a vowel there. They're just a separate syllable. If it's a separate syllable with a vowel, we don't say that's a syllabic L. So this doesn't apply to my English. It does apply to the way Peter Latifoged spoke. Pablo. Whistle, all right, whistle, no vowel. Uh, but also after nasals, as in kennel, channel. Are those syllabic L's for me? Kennel, channel. No, so it would have to be kennel, channel. And I want to throw in here, before we go on, how many of you have studied some German? A few of you. German is full of this kind of pronunciation. So, for example, uh, Guten Morgen is good morning, right? Now, G and N, are they home organic? G and N. No, they're not. One is Wieler, one is Alveolar. But this is the way Germans usually say it. Guten Morgen. Guten Morgen. Guten Morgen. Yeah, just about anything ending in a nasal in German with, a, with, a obstruent before, with an obstruent before it will turn into a syllabic nasal at the end. It's very, very pubian in German. It's interesting because I've had German students before at Taida, and not, not Huarin, just plain old Germans. And they're usually unaware of these rules. First of all, they will say, oh, we don't do that in German. And then they just think about it. And they go, hey, we do it all the time. <laughs> That's what happens. Just like when we said that final voice stops in German, are devoiced. They're not voiced at all. For example, the word for bath. What's that? Well, in, G well, in English it's bat, but this is German. Bat. And what does the D sound like? Is it voiced or not? No. So final voiced consonants, final voiced stops in German are not voiced. They look like they're voiced. They were originally voiced, we assume. But they are not voiced. And I had a German student who protested. He said, no, 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 we pronounce those. I said, how do you say this word? He said, but, uh. <laughs> he said, uh, yeah, OK. <laughs> he suddenly was confronted with the way he really speaks. So that has happened to me a number of times with different rules with Germans. They're not really aware of their language either. Just like I've told you things about Chinese you didn't know before, like with Yi, et cetera. So don't feel bad. The Germans do it too, OK? Um, I'd like to get through these before you run off to your break. Let's, let's kind of push through. So we have uh, words like barrel, uh, kennel, channel, barrel. None of these for me are syllabic. I have a schwa in all of them. Snarl, in theory, should be syllabic. Snarl, snarl. But how many syllables does it sound like to your ears? Snarl, snarl. Does anybody here too? Okay. To me, as the speaker of this particular variety, it sounds like two. Snarl, snarl. I hear schwa. So that's true with a lot of words, but not all. With different vowels, it'll be different. Girl, girl. That's pretty much clearly only one syllable for me. All right. When it is not part of the vowel, r is like l in most forms of American English in that it too can be syllabic when it occurs at the end of a word and after a consonant, as in, um, I'm going to have to put on my glasses because I keep mistaking letters here. Just a minute. Okay, saber. Saber is a kind of wu uh, qi. Qi, qi, you know that one? Anyway, um, saber, razor, hammer, tailor. You could say them as syllabic, or you could call them syllabic, because er 
has R from the beginning to the end in it. It's the only vowel, the U uh vowel. When we have R coloring, the R starts immediately at the beginning and, is, and it goes all the way through. If it is another vowel like O, like four, four, 前面没有 R. But the ER sound, the schwa, that has R all the way through. Everybody see what I'm saying? So in these cases, you can say that it's a syllabic R if you want to, because the vowel and the R are inseparable. 完全是分不开的。你要说是 ER， 可是其实都是同时进行的。So we could call that also a syllabic R. If we introduce a new term, liquid, and we've already had that, it's called what in Chinese? Liu Yin. Which is used simply as a cover term for the consonants u and er. We may rephrase the statement in twelve and say twelve a. Same person. Number twelve a. The liquids u、uh, er are syllabic at the end of a word when immediately after a consonant. But we have to remember this is very problematic. There are many many exceptions, and it depends on your variety of English. A different dialect will do different things, so it's almost impossible to generalize. The next statement also applies more to American English than to British English. It accounts for the t in fatty. Data, but note that these are not the only contexts in which these changes occur. This is not simply a change that affects t after a stressed vowel and before it an unstressed one. In that t between two unstressed vowels, as in divinity, is also affected. However, not all cases of t between vowels change in this way. The t in attack is voiceless. We don't say attack because what? We say attack. We don't say attack. The t is between two vowels, but why don't we say adapt? Because the second syllable is stressed, so it doesn't work there. And I also say fricative. I don't say fricative. I suppose it's possible, but it sounds odd. I say fricative. I don't have a rule for it, but this rule is really hard to write in a really comprehensive way. And t after another consonant, for example, in hasty and captive, is also voiceless. Listen, hasty, captive, captive. Like fricative, 就是一样 But fricative, 那个是 fricka. There's a vowel. So this thing is very messy. It's messy. The rules really don't cover everything. English speakers have a very similar articulatory gesture in words containing d and n. In similar circumstances, such as daddy and nan,、uh, many. The first of these words, these two words, could well be transcribed as daddy. If we say it quickly, we're not lengthening the the, the double d there. It is a tap, daddy, daddy. But in theory, we could we could lengthen it if we wanted to, daddy, daddy. It's a kaida, but wader is not kaida. So, on the surface, we may have a tap, but underneath it's still a d. But in water, underneath it's a t, but that's a tap deep down. Okay. The second has the same sound, except that it's nasalized. So we could do this. This is unusual, and I don't encourage it. But just theoretically, you can take a tap symbol and put a bolang hao over it, which means nasalization. So if it's a nasalized tap, then we get many. Right? We could do that in a narrow transcription to show that the n is really, really a short、uh, tap. It's a very short touching of the tip of the tongue to the alveolar ridge. Nasalization is shown by the diacritic tilde over a symbol. The following statement. Accounts for all these facts. Thirteen.、Um, Next reader. Um, Kathy. Okay. Thirteen. Alveolar stops become voice taps when they occur between two vowels, the second of which is unstressed. All right. We've already talked about that. Many speakers of American English require a similar rule to describe a sequence of an alveolar nasal followed by a stop. In the words in words such as painter and splinter, the t is lost and a nasal tap occurs. Now it didn't sound like that the way I just said it. I said it carefully. Painter, splinter, but I could say painter, splinter. I would say that if I were talking really casually. But when I'm reading from a book, I will say painter and splinter. The t is lost when a nasal tap occurs. This has resulted in winter and winner and pain,、uh, panting and panning being pronounced in the same way. So winner, last winner. I usually say that last winner instead of last winter. That sounds too formal. Last winter, last winner. The winner is, and panting and panning being pronounced in the same way. For these speakers, we can restate thirteen, making it Kathy. Alveolar stops and alveolar nasal plus stop sequences became become voice taps when they occur between two vowels, the second of which is unstressed. Everybody follow that. Alveolar stops, t 
and alveolar nasal N plus stop sequences with another stop after it, like winter, become voiced taps when they occur between two vowels, the second of which is unstressed. All right, so alveolar stops and alveolar nasal plus stop. That's, I'm sorry, I think I, miss, I didn't, didn't explain this correctly. It should be alveolar stops, just to. That becomes a tap between two vowels. Or if you have an alveolar nasal mm, plus an alveolar uh, stop, then you get winner. All right, they become voice taps when they occur between two vowels, the second of which is unstressed. In the second case, it is a nasal tap. There's a great deal of variation among speakers with respect to this statement. Some make taps in familiar words, such as auntie. Some say ani. Some can say ani. Or ani. Ani or ani. Yo it din din, the negative ganja. But not in less common words, such as Dante. Nobody would say Dani. Bukana. Dante. Some make them only in fast speech. I, I do it in fast speech. Not for every single one, but I do it a lot. Try to formulate a statement in a way that describes your own speech. Let's continue, 14. Uh, Jerome, 14. Alveolar consonants become dentals before dental consonants, as in eighth, tenth, wealth. Note that this statement applies to all alveolar consonants, not just stops, and often applies across wor word boundaries. Word boundaries. Word, bound word boundaries, as in at this. This is a statement in which, in English, the gestures for these two consonants overlap. Overlap. Overlap so much, so much, that the place of articulation for the first consonant is changed. Okay, in this case, the th is so strong it influences the consonant before it to become dental. In a more rapid style of speech, some of these dental consonants tend to be omitted altogether, and I omit the t in eighth. I've, I've never said the t in eighth, as far as I know. Say these words first slowly and then more rapidly, and see what you do yourself. It is difficult to make precise statements about when consonants get deleted because this depends so much on the style of speech being used. That's something to pay attention for the test. All right? How do we know? How can we generalize? How do we make the rules when we don't know the style of speech? That's one thing that is going to influence strongly what we say in the rule. And that's one reason why we can't make really good rules because the style of speech will determine what we actually do. And we do many different things. Alveolar stops often appear to get dropped in phrases such as fact-finding. Fact-finding. I don't drop it. Can you hear it? Listen and watch. Fact-finding. Did I drop the T? Fact-finding. I didn't drop it. It's just unreleased. It's unreleased, but my tongue is there and I held in the air. So that was most definitely an alveolar stop. You just can't hear it. Most people say, most people, you can't hear the T, with no audible T. And they produce phrases such as, send papers with no audible, audible D. We could state this as follows, as follows. So, send papers, send papers, the D often is not audible. But your tongue may be there, making the D. Number 15? 15. Alveolar stops are reduced or omitted when between two consonants. Okay. So if we have a T between two other consonants, we reduce them. And I think they're more often reduced than omitted, but they are also omitted. Rule 15 raises an interesting point of phonetic theory. Note that we said alveolar stops often appear to get dropped, and there may be no audible D. That means the D is there, but you can't hear it. However, the tongue tip gesture for the alveolar stop in most people may be present, but just not audible, because it is completely overlapped by the labial stop following. So most people, I've got my T there, I've got my tongue there for the T, but the P kind of drowns it out. So this one is also hard to formulate. Just because you can't hear it doesn't mean it's not there. More commonly, it is partially omitted. That is to say, the tongue tip moves up for the alveolar stop but does not make a complete closure. So your tongue goes up but maybe you're not making a really solid T there. When we think in terms of phonetic symbols, we can write most people or most people. This makes it a question of whether the T is there or not, but 
That is not really the issue. Part of the tongue tip gesture may have been made a fact we have no way of symbolizing. So a lot of things happen we just can't describe. We can write what we hear, but we really don't know what's happening, so we can't describe it. Check how you say phrases such as best game and grand master. Everybody try best game. Best game. Grand master. Grand master. All right, I'm being careful, so I say the D, but in context, I might say grand master, and you don't hear the D at all. Say these in familiar phase, uh, phrases with and without the alveolar stop. You may find it difficult to formulate a statement that takes into account all the contexts where alveolar stops may not appear in your speech. It's really hard to describe exactly what happens in what situation. We must state not only where consonants get dropped, but also where they get added. Words such as something and youngster often get pronounced as something and youngster. We finally come to the place in the text where they tell us about it. I told you in class quite a while ago. These are called epithetic stops. In a similar way, many people do not distinguish between prince, prince and prince or tense and tense. It's hard for me to distinguish. All these words may be pronounced with a short voiceless stop between the nasal and the voiceless fricative, but the stop is not really an added gesture. It's simply the result of changing the timing of the nasal gesture. Underline that. Why do we get that epithetic stop? Because we stop nasalizing. So if our tongue is on our alveolar ridge to make an N, but then we turn off the nasalization, we turn off the, the um, airstream going through the nose, what happens? The N is going to turn into, if we turn on the, the nasal part of N, we make it oral, what's going to happen? It turns into T. Right. That's why we get it. We've, it's a matter of timing. We turned off the nasal part, so it becomes oral. And that's why we get that epithetic stop. So it's not like we made a, we just It just happens due to timing. By rushing the raising of the velum for a nasal, a moment of complete closure, a stop, occurs. The apparent insertion of a stop into the middle of a word in this way is known as apenthesis. means is apenthesis. Everyone, apenthesis. If we wanted to make a formal statement of this phenomenon, we could say, 16? Claire, a homogenic voiceless stop may occur after a nasal before a voiceless fricative followed by an unstressed vowel in the same word. All right, that's the rule. We have a nasal, and then we have it, it's, it is followed by, it's followed by a voiceless. Everybody, we have a nasal followed by a voiceless fricative. Right, and what do we get that we didn't expect? We get an epithetic stop, and we can add one more adjective in there. We get a homorganic voiceless stop. Homorganic with the preceding sound or the following sound. Homorganic with the nasal or homorganic homo homo with the voiceless fricative that follows. Homorganic with the previous sound, the nasal. Right, so prints. T is homorganic with the N sound, right? The N sound. Speakers who have an epithetic stop in the noun, noun concert. Can you hear it? Concert. Is there a T in there? Concert. 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 I can say concert, but it'll usually be concert. Can you hear a T in there? in. Do not usually have one in verbal derivatives, such as concerted, or in words such as concern because the second syllable is stressed. That's going to take away the apenthesis. Nothing need be said about the vowel before the nasal apenthesis may, like the T to tap change in statement 13, occur between unstressed vowels. It is possible to hear an inserted T in both agency, grievances, agency. Statement 16 raises a theoretical point similar to that discussed in connection with 15, where we were concerned with whether a segment had been deleted. Remember winter, winter, did we delete it or not? Now we are concerned with whether a segment has been added. This is 
In each case, it is better to treat these as misleading questions, or asking the wrong question, and to think about the gestures involved rather than worry about the symbols that might or might not represent the separate segments. So, just think about, um, it says, think about the gestures involved. Think about the gestures, don't worry so much about the symbols. It may be convenient to transcribe something as something, something, and we often hear the P. I have something for you. There's a P there. But transcription is only a tool and should not be thought of as necessarily portraying the units used in a production of speech. So if you don't put the P in there, yeah, hi, how. Just make sure you understand the gestures. The next statement accounts for the shortening effects that occur when two identical consonants come next to one another, as in big game and top post. Somebody asked about this in freshman English today. It, you, it is usually not accurate to say that one of these consonants is dropped. There are two consonantal gestures, but they overlap considerably. Even in casual speech, most people would distinguish between stray tissue and straight issue. Well, especially because of the tap. Stray tissue, straight, stray tissue, straight issue. For me, there's a pause or a tap. And straight tissue, not, I think it's a ting, doing straight tissue. Let's try those three, everybody. Stray tissue. Stray tissue. Straight issue. Straight issue. Straight tissue. Straight tissue. Okay, these are good examples for contrasting um, the different possibilities. Try saying these sentences such as, in, in sentences such as, that's a stray tissue, that's a straight issue, that's a straight tissue. But there clearly is a shortening effect that we can state as follows. A consonant is shortened when it is before an identical consonant. So, straight tissue, 不等于两个t,它比两个t稍微短一点,可能是一个半的长度. That's what they're saying. So, 一个半,后面那个半, 有点打折扣,不是两个整个完整的T,是一个又半个. So they're saying 其中一个好像被剪短一些. That's what they're saying here. We can describe the overlapping gestures that result in more advanced articulations of K in cap, kept, kit, key, and of G in gap, get, give, geese. You should be able to feel the fronted position of your tongue, uh, your tongue contact in the latter words of these series. We can say, so everybody, let's just say them. Um, go through the series, go. Cap. Let's try that again, go. The second one is kept, everybody, kept. Not capped, kept. Okay, do that series again, cap. Very good, the G series. It's not geese. First of all, the S, is it an S or a Z? It's an S. And second, since it's an S, do we have E, a really long E? No. Geese. 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 Right. This morning, some students were saying close for close. And then they, they got rid of the Z, and then they said it's very close. Is that right? No. Hi, Zidwan. Everyone close. 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 All right. Number 18, please. Filler stops become more front before more front vowels. All right. We know that. So for um, velar stops, we have um, like g, gap, get, give, geese. They are more front when we have more front vowels. So uh, let's. it's better to look at something like uh, cap. All of these are more front, okay, because they're all front vowels. But if we have like ga or ka, that's going to be more back. All right? And then finally, we need to note the difference in the quality of ul in life and in file, the dark L, or clap. My clap is a bit dark. And talc, talc is like um, a fen. Uh, what's talc? Talc. That's the red one. That's exactly it. Couldn't think of it. That's talc. Um, or uh, feeling and feel. Feeling, because of the, con of the vowel that comes after the L, it's a clear L. Feeling. 
or could be dark plus a clear L. Feeling, 可能是两个 L 连续念的 The other one is feel. That's definitely dark. Everyone feeling. feeling. I have both. I have dark plus clear, and then feel. feel. That's just dark. Okay, nineteen. The lateral L is velarized. V. Uh, vel velarized. Okay. When after a vowel or before a consonant at the end of the word. And that's easy to remember. Just put a tilde in the middle of the L. That means velarized. Note that there are clearly distinct gestures required for U in the different circumstances. These are not differences that can be ascribed to overlapping gestures. Let's take a break. We're on page 77, we're going to talk about the last paragraph, diacritics. And um, I will just go over this uh, for you. Diacritics, we know those are extra symbols that we add. For example, nasalization or voicelessness or that a sound is dental. Those are diacritics, extra marks that we add. Make sure you can define diacritics. Let's look at the glossary in the back to make sure we can define diacritics. What page is it on? I have it in the glossary in the back of the book. 306, good. Whose turn is it? Whose turn? I want you to read the definition in the glossary. Wait a minute for the camera. Uh, joy, diacritic, small added mark that can be used to distinguish different values of a symbol. Of a. Of a. Of a. Of, of a right. symbol. Right. For example, the addition the, of, the addition of. A tilde. A tilde mm -hmm. distinguishes a velarized the. from. Velarized from a non-velarized sound. Non-velarized. Non-velarized sound, as in. All. Oh, as opposed to l. L. All right. I would suggest everybody copy this into your notes. And when I say I would suggest, you can understand that as. As what, Amy? Right. And not just that. That's not really what I meant. If I say I would suggest you do something, it's because what? It may well be on the test. So I already tell you ahead of time what's going to be on the test, right? That should have helped you prepare a bit. Be able to define a diacritic. Just like you needed to be able to define phonetics and phonology and the differences between the two. Whenever you've got a really important concept like that, this is actually fairly important. It's a tool. I mean, not hugely, hugely important, but important enough. Make sure you can define it. Memorize the definition because my experience is, if somebody just asked me, what's phonetics? I teach it, but I have to look it up in the book. Because I don't have a short, to the point definition ready. It's too much. I can't tell you in one sentence. Ah, but the book usually can. So any kind of a new concept, especially in bold, but sometimes they're not in bold, any new concept, epenthetic is another one, right? Make sure that you can define epenthetic. Home organic, make sure you can define that. All of those, memorize the definitions. That will make life easier not only for you, but for the TAs and me as well. Because otherwise, we have to shang ban tian yao kou ji fen, yao suan ji fen. And, right? Uh, Mandy, too? And I have to say, ta man liang ge zhen de si yo zhe ge tian fen. Both of them can be really good teachers. Yin wei ta man kou de na ge fen, ta man zhua de zhen de fei chang zhun, na nie de, na nie de fei chang de zhun. Usually, it's exactly what I would have done. So, but does it take extra time when somebody gets a half right answer? If it's a completely wrong answer, is that hard? Completely wrong is not hard. Completely right, is that hard? No. Half right? That's the worst. I can just tell when I was looking at there. Right? It's really tiring. So either Either just decide you're not going to pass the test and don't study, or otherwise get it all correct. All right, so diacritics, you can now define that, I hope. It should go in your notes. In this end, the previous chapter, we have seen how the transcription of English can be made more detailed by the use of diacritic small marks added to a symbol to narrow its meaning. That means to make it more specific.
更详细，应该这么说 ，more detailed. The six diacritics we have introduced so far are shown in Table 3.2. You should learn the use of these diacritics before you attempt any further detailed transcription exercises. Note that the nasalization diacritic is a small wavy line called a tilde, and it's written above the symbol. And velarization is also written with a tilde through the middle of the symbol. Nasalization is more common among vowels, which will be discussed in the next chapter, but we're going to do chapter five next. We're going to save four till last because we'll probably rush. We're going to go through five slightly in a slightly less rushed way. And Stanley just pointed out something quite interesting in table 3.2, something inconsistent. Can the rest of you find what he found? Look at the whole table. Is there something a little odd? The velarized symbol, it's shown as the tilde in the middle of the L, but on the left they wrote an oo, and an oo is not strange because that's a velar sound. It's way back, it's high, and it's back. That's in the velar area. But they didn't explain it. They just threw it in there. So I would say that that's something that needs to be fixed. Last class, after class, somebody asked me if there's a way of indicating, indicating that a sound is more front or more back, like ka and ki, right? Or if it's more or less rounded. For example, oo is very rounded, oo is less rounded. Or Twin, the T is rounded there, right? Yes. Whenever you're wondering if we can indicate something in your transcription, where do you go? We just talked about diacritics. So if we want to indicate some more detail, like key and ka, one is more front, one is more back. If we want to indicate that kind of detail, where do we go? Here we are, right here. Where do we go? The inside front cover, the inside of the front cover. Can you see it? Um, how about if you all just read to me the different things that we can indicate with diacritics? See, that whole Xiaomu is called diacritics. And if you're using that I Speak online software, that application, they have different categories. Pulmonic 1, Pulmonic 2, vowels, diacritics. All right, let's just read them all together. Everybody go. Voiceless, and don't say voiceless. 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 All right, little circle underneath the symbol. Next. Voice. And you can see that looks like a. Right? That's voiced. We don't usually use that one that much. Take a pusa in common. We could. Okay, but we really don't use it very often. Next. Very good. More rounded. Right, and it's pointing which way? Is it pointing left? It's pointing right, isn't it? Pointing. So they go to the defang. Oh, you said so trickles in Ali, right? I'm I'm saying that go to the defang in Ali. So it's pointing right in my conception. Okay, the next one, read. Okay, and next. Mm hmm. Advanced means more to the front. 比较前 more front. That's what advanced means. Next. And that's easy to remember. Wang Qian is plus. Wang Hou is a minus. Easy to remember. Retracted means Wang Hou Tui Suo. Next. Centralized. We've got that little two dots. Just like in which language? Albanian. Yeah, remember Albanian, that E with the little two dots? Good. Next. Mid-centralized. We don't use that so much, but when we need it, it's there. Next. Syllabic, everyone knows that. You used a dot before, now it's a little line. Next. Non-syllabic, non also not so common. I have not seen that that much, but it's useful, I'm sure, in some cases. Next. Roticity, good. That little hook, we all know that. Next. No, we say breathy. Breathy. That's from the noun breath, not the noun breathe, uh, not the verb breathe. So breathy. We haven't learned that yet. We'll learn that second semester. Next. Creaky voice. We know creaky from ah uh, when we were learning about formants. And this again is a tilde written where? Under the symbol. So we've got above, middle, and under. They all have different meanings. Next. Lingual labial. This is a new symbol. This was only instituted less than 10 years ago, I think. 
So linguo is tongue labial. Look. Like this. All right. Next. Labialized. Good. That means lip rounding, right? Chunhua. Some kind of lip rounding, but not necessarily as round as ooh. It may more be more like shh. So there are degrees of labialization. Next. Palatalize, and that's like tie, die, li, li, etc. There's a lot of that in, in Kejiahua. Next, velarized. Now, they just gave us an u for that symbol, right? But it's not an u. You can see here it's a gamma. That's the Greek letter gamma. And this sound is pronounced g. It's a chang de g. Duan de si ge mo in, like tuzi. If you're doing a Beijing accent. This is a gamma, and then this is a vowel. You can find this vowel. Everybody find this vowel so you know where it is. And we talked about it before. It's mid-high, rounded, and uh, unrounded, and back. So mid-high, back, unrounded. Everybody find it? Inside of the back cover. Good. So, velarized is shogunhua or ranghua is a gamma, g. Nigga, fu hao ben sen jiu se g. Voiced velar what? G is a voiced velar fricative. Write that down or make some kind of note of it. It's worth knowing. G. We're going to need that symbol in the future. And I think you find it in some Formosan languages. Um, let's see, how far did we get? So labialized, palatalized, velarized, next, pharyngealized. That's found in Arabic, for example, and also I think in some Caucasian languages. That's really low uh, down there. Um, velarized or pharyngealized. And raised, we know from velar raising. If we turn it upside down, it's lowered. Bijad it's a capital T. Advanced tongue root, we'll learn, learn that next semester. That's advanced tongue root. And then retract it, of the sugan. Then, next is? Dental, next? Apical. Apex is is apical. And we use apical for the very, very tip of the tongue. The apex. Apical. For example, in Chinese, are apical. They're usually called dental. Passive articulator. They call them chin. But in English, we call them apical. That's worth knowing. Zi, 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 are apical. Write it down. It's useful. Next is laminal. Laminal, that means she ye. She ye in. It's just a little square. Actually, it's a rectangle, I think. Next. Nasalized is bi hua. Not bi in, it's bi hua. For example, a, a. You can also nasalize sounds like l. Wu, mu. Then L, R, you can nasalize, bi hua. So that means we've got air coming out of both the nose and the mouth. Then we've got a nasal release, like no, no, in Russian. Okay? Um, then we have a lateral release, la, la. And you'll find that in some Native American languages, I think with T especially. Lateral release. No audible release is unreleased. No audible release is unreleased. We've already talked about that. And then we've got a couple of others. We don't need to cover those now. I think that's quite enough for now. And additional things, we're going to learn super segmentals in chapter 5. So we have now finished chapter 3. And to remind you, the exercises, again, have numbering problems. Be aware of that. Um, Sophie, have you already posted the numbering problems? OK, maybe you can do that again. You're so good at finding that before I do. 
But these things happen year after year, and I usually forget to mention it myself. Mm. So next time will be the 26th. You hand in your class notes plus the plot assignment, and your written and performance exercises are due also next Monday. Written and performance exercises have both ready. Make sure you've written them all out, not just thought about them in your head. And you will get some help from the website if you need it. And there's a tool that I can tell you about that might be helpful. It's the One Look Dictionary. Do you all know about it? Because in the One Look Dictionary, if you're working, looking for a word, for example, that ends in en, you can just da xing hao, then en. All the words that end in en, you'll find it that way. Or maybe you want words that end in ten. Or maybe you just want all of the words that start with B and end with T and have one letter between them. Just put a question mark. Question mark is one character, 一个字源。这个是若干,无限多的,不管多少. And it also has other search functions. Read the site. They have instructions. They will tell you how to... Look for, for example, for consonants and vowels. They have separate symbols, so check those out. They're very useful. One look is truly useful for phonotactic exercises and other phonetic exercises sometimes. You know, I think that's it, unless we have questions. The rest of the questions we're going to cover on the 26th when we go through the exercises. Anybody have anything you want to ask? We're going to go to chapter 5. Let's go. Actually, the exercises for chapter four, that's when you'll really need one look. This one is not so bad, but for chapter four, you're going to need this. So you might want to start the exercises for chapter four early, because that's, that's the one where we want as many examples as you can find. For chapter three, actually, they usually tell you only give so many examples, maybe three examples. But for chapter four, we want as many as you can find. Everybody get that? So, chapter four. Maybe not right now, because you're very busy. But before too long, start working on the chapter four exercises because those, those really take a lot of thought and time. All right, we're going to chapter five. We'll, we do have a time to start. So our next reader? Alice. Okay. Mm -hmm. Chapter five, English words and sentences. Words in connected speech. In previous chapters, we considered- In previous chapters, we have day B. In previous chapters, mm -hmm. we considered lists of words that illustrated the contrast between consonants and the contrast between vowels. This is a good way of starting to look at the gestures that make up the words of English, or indeed of any language, as we will see later. But speech is not really composed not. of- Not, was a not, not. Oh, it's not really composed of a series of distinct gestures, and anyway, we don't usually And anyway, watch and the continuation rise. Okay. And anyway, we don't usually speak using isolated words. Pay attention to that because in this chapter we're going to put a lot of emphasis on this idea that we don't usually speak using isolated words. And words in context will have a lot of changes that take place in them, okay? As we saw in chapter 1, when looking at the short movie clip on a short movie clip short movie clip of on top of his deck, all the, all the actions run together, making it very hard to see separate gestures. It's useful to look at short, specially constructed phrases so as to be able to see the main aspects of individual vowels. Individual. And individual. No, it's not V, it's V. Individual. 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 That's better. Individual vowels and consonants. 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 Yeah, Alice now jia chang need a continuation, okay. right? Consonants, as we did using X ray clips. X ray clips. X ray clips in chapter two and three. Chapters. Z. Chapters two and three. Mm -hmm. But now we must look at how pronunciations of individual. In the. In individual. The. Individual. Individual words. Individual. Individual. That's good. Words compare with what happens in more normal connected speech. All right. That's the theme of this chapter. What happens to sounds in, so wait a normal, more normal connected speech. And if you look at a word all by itself, it's called the citation form. Okay, I'm going to summarize now. It's almost time. 
At least one syllable is fully stressed and there's no reduction of vowel quality. That's an important idea. So in a word, especially a content word, because if it's a function word, we often pronounce it in a, with a reduced vowel. So in a word, one syllable, at least one syllable will be stressed. And that syllable will have a vowel that is not a schwa. It will not be a schwa. It will have at least one stressed syllable. It will be a clear, full vowel, not a schwa. But in connected speech, many changes may take place. Consider, for example, the spectrogram in figure 5.1. Now look at that on the next page, bottom of 108. Do you see the spectrogram there? Uh, this is too early to try and teach you all about spectrograms. We're going to go into these in detail second semester. But I will just tell you basically what to look at. The vertical black lines, you can see there are vertical black lines. Those are the pulses of the vocal folds. So each vertical black line, like with the waveform, is one pulse of the vocal folds. Then you see those dark bands? That's called a voice bar. If you have voicing, you will see that's a called a voice bar. Then you see these big bars. bar, right? Is there everybody, is everybody with me? Those are formants. Those are formants. We've already learned what formants are, so since we worked so much on it early in the semester, this is going to be a lot easier, especially second semester. Because in the those are formants. F1, F2, F3, F4. F4 is not important for our purposes. F1, F2 are the most important. F3 concerns rounding, lip rounding especially. And R's, lip rounding and R's, and R's are rounded anyway. So that's what those are. Now it says to look at the spectrogram. And it says this is our first spectrogram of speech, so you shouldn't expect to get much out of it at first. But even with only a little explanation of how to read a spectrogram, you should be able to tell that the word opposite was said in two different ways in this utterance. It says the opposite direction, and I went in the opposite direction. So we have two phrases, two uses of the word, two occurrences of the word opposite. The first one is shorter, the opposite direction. The second one is in a longer phrase, and I went in the opposite direction. Which one do you think is going to be more detailed and more like the citation form? The first one just because there are fewer words, right? And if you look at the Spectrogram, just look where it says opposite on the left and opposite on the right. What happened to the one on the right that you can just see visually, just looking at it, knowing very little or nothing at all about spectrograms, what can you say? It's shorter. Good. What else? The darkness of the lines reflects how loud the sound is. So if it's very dark, it's louder. If it's very light, it's softer. So what else can you say? It's softer, it's not as loud, right? The formants are not quite as clear. So those two things, those are, those are already quite a, a bit of information. Um, the speaker was being interviewed, and the topic of life, cho life choices came up. He was talking about choosing between a life of crime or a life in a religious discipline. And he said, and he said, or I was going to go in the opposite direction. And I went in the opposite direction. Now what happened the second time? Or I was going to go in the opposite direction. And I went in the opposite direction. What did I do? It's de-stressed in the second part because it's old information. It's repeated information. So you can see that clearly in the spectrogram. And that's typical of some of the changes that we're going to be discussing. 
They both seem to be perfectly, uh, perfectly acceptable American pronunciations of the word, but the spectrogram shows some differences. The second opposite is phonetically reduced. Because it's old information, we don't need to stress everything and make it so clear. There are arrows under the portions of the spectrogram that correspond to vowel sounds. The first opposite has three arrows corresponding to the three vowels that we expect in the citation form of the word, while in the second production, we can only identify two vowel segments. All right, that's a good introduction to the chapter. That's going to give you an idea of the direction that we're going in. Any questions before we wrap up for today? Any questions at all? Remember that NTU Phonetics is always open, even at 3 in the morning sometimes, <laughs> for your questions and comments and contributions. And let me emphasize again, even those of you who did OK on the test but could do better, I recommend that 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon or evening sometime, reading sentence by sentence to make sure that you have all this stuff really solid in your head. So no questions? We'll see you next Monday. Don't forget to bring all your homework.